Well, we're in uh, Luke, we're finishing up Luke chapter 3, so it's Luke 3, 21 through 38. Don't panic. Uh, the genealogy is in here, and uh, Cindy asked me, are you going to go over every name? <laughs> no, uh, I'm not, but... This is the last half of Luke's uh, third chapter, and in it, he covers two topics, Jesus' baptism and this genealogy. I didn't communicate that expressly in the title of our lesson this morning, which is Jesus' baptism, the God-man embarks, uh, though Luke's genealogy is his own way of embarking on the narration of Christ's earthly ministry. But for Luke, the baptism of Jesus was, was clearly uh, the point of departure uh, from the preparatory nature of John the Baptist's ministry and the assumption of its exclusive uh, focus on the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry. And consequently, we'll see that Luke doesn't even name John in his description of the baptism. Matthew and Mark do, they name John the Baptist, uh, but Luke does not. He views it uh, rather as something of a definitive call to Jesus for his ministry. With the Holy Spirit, you know the account, with the Holy Spirit descending as a dove upon him and the voice of the Father from heaven pronouncing his blessing upon his son, this is the point from which Jesus officially embarks upon his life's mission. Sorry. Do I speak loud enough? <laughs> okay. A certain person asked me to speak up or suggested I might, but uh, the genealogy uh, we will see and you probably already know, differs in many respects from Matthew's. Matthew is the other gospel writer who has the genealogy. We're gonna identify uh, some of those and attempt to explain one major uh, difference. But the fact of a genealogy itself for Jesus Christ is of importance. Uh, genealogies are, are tools that we use to trace the path of history, and they often reveal mysteries. Cindy and I have some longtime friends who many years ago adopted two daughters uh, separately and raised them, and today they're adults. And one of those daughters uh, confided in her father uh, recently that she had traced down her uh, birth a father and mother, and she had even spoken uh, to one of them. Uh, the story ends well, th uh, thankfully, and the best thing that came out of it was that she uncovered the mystery of, of what exactly happened when she was conceived and came into uh, this world and became the daughter of these adoptive parents. It helped identify her place in the world. Well, the genealogies of Jesus provided by both Luke and Matthew reveal many interesting things. They raise some difficult uh, my my mysteries, but above all, they show that Jesus was an historical figure, one fully integrated into our human race. And combined with the account of his baptism, we see him as the person he is a real man who cemented that, if we can put it that way, by identifying with sinful men and undergoing the baptism that fulfilled God's will for men at the time. At the same time, it revealed in a unique way his eternal deity when the Holy Spirit came down from heaven to anoint him and the voice rang down from above, from his father, affirming that the man being baptized was God's own beloved son. So let's read it, uh, beginning in verse 21, 
It will help you concentrate, knowing I'm not going to read all these verses. I'm going to skip a few, and I'll, I'll explain that in a, in, a sec, in a second. Now, when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came out of heaven, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. When he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, or Heli. Um, that's the probable uh, text, Heli, the son of, of Heli. And now I'm going to, and I'll explain that later, now I'm going to skip down to verse 31 and pick it up uh, where uh, David is included in the genealogy. These names uh, b between 23 and 31 are different names than you, you see in, in Matthew's genealogy. And we'll talk about why that is. Verse 31, the son of Malaya, the son of Mena, the son of Mathatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salmon, the son of Nashon, the son of Amenadab, the son of Admin, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Sarag, the son of Ru, the son of Peleg, the son of Heber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of, 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 of Arpaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. There is something fulfilling <clears throat> about reading the genealogy. Those familiar names uh, reminding us of the great history of, of God's working with his people. We get to those names that we're so familiar with and it's a reminder, this is real. This is, this, this is, is history. So we have here two contributions to the gospel account, Jesus' baptism, and uh, this, this genealogy. But first, Jesus is baptized. Luke states that he was also baptized when all the people were baptized. And that's the context. After all, John the Baptist was the forerunner to Messiah, and he got this descriptive name, John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, because of his ministry of calling uh, the people of Israel to repentance of sin in order to prepare them for the coming of Messiah. Uh, their baptisms marked their identifications with those mutual decisions and their mutual faith. But the question that immediately meets us, though, is why? Uh, why was Jesus baptized when all these repentant sinners were, were baptized? Because a fundamental tenet of the person and life of our Lord Jesus Christ was that he was no sinner. He was the sinless son of God. Well, we find some help in Matthew's account. He describes John trying to dissuade Jesus from being baptized by him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you. And, and do you come to me? And Jesus' answer uh, was permitted at this time for in this way, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So there's her answer, right? Except questions uh, remain. Uh, I have a friend who asked me several days ago, what are you teaching on uh, Sunday? And I said, the baptism of Jesus, and he, he quickly admitted how puzzling that was to him that Jesus would have undergone 
John's baptism of repentance. So I'm the teacher. I responded by pointing to that verse, that verse in Matthew, uh, in how Jesus says, well, it's fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And my friend, uh, who has a very quick mind, then said, yeah, well, what does that mean? But Jesus had come to earth to identify himself with sinful man. He was himself sinless, but his mission was to take upon himself their condition so that he might fulfill for them what they were unable to fulfill for themselves. So Jesus observed these sinners flocking uh, to John's baptism, and that was the right thing for them uh, to do in the eyes of God. And so he took his place with them. He stepped in and got among them. Uh, if he was to embark on his life's mission, he would first publicly identify himself with the sinners he had come to save. Well, if we lay uh, Luke's uh, very brief account side by side with Matthew's, and some of you may be doing that, holding your finger there, uh, we, we have a fuller picture. Uh, Jesus <clears throat> went to the Jordan River where John was baptizing. Uh, John baptized him. Uh, then after he came up out of, of the water, uh, the heavens opened. Except at that point, Luke adds something. He tells us that Jesus was praying. Of all the gospel writers, Luke seems to have been especially impressed with the Lord's habit of prayer. He would slip away into the wilderness to pray, Luke 5, 16. Go off to a mountain and spend the whole night in prayer, chapter 6, verse 12. Pray alone, 9, 18. With others, 9, 28. Pray and teach. Luke 11, verse 1, and often pray passionately. Think uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. Think Jesus on the cross. Here at his baptism, he prays. He had learned to pray. Uh, Thirty years of living and, and learning had taught him the importance and the blessing of prayer. And now as he began his public ministry with the end in mind he finds strength in the intimacy he knew with his father in heaven well surely there is inspiration for us in in Christ's example he fled to prayer he found strength in prayer at the start of his ministry he prayed and at the end as he suffered on the cross especially then he prayed after a night in Gethsemane, uh, praying with such anguish that we're told his sweat fell like drops of blood. He hung on the cross and he prayed. He prayed for his enemies. He prayed for his uh, mother. Uh, he prayed a prayer of forsakenness. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And ultimately a prayer of willing surrender. I know we sometimes find it difficult to pray. That's the, is there anything more obvious uh, than that? We find it difficult to pray, it difficult to find, difficult to make time to pray, uh, difficult to concentrate in prayer as worldly cares intrude on our thoughts, a uh, sin, sin perhaps has interfered in our life to divert our attention away from the Lord. We're not the sinless son of God, so we may not pray perfectly as he did or as gladly as he did, but that only underscores how vital to our spiritual health prayer is. If we are to truly enjoy, and this is a true thing, it's, these are not, words on a paper. If we are to truly enjoy God's blessings to the full in this life, we must become, as the Lord was, disciplined people of prayer. 
And now, now Luke tells us that as Jesus prayed, three things happened. Heaven was opened, uh, the Holy Spirit descended upon him, and his Father spoke. Now I want you to notice here the way that Luke describes these events. The, the baptism itself seems almost incidental to what followed. Uh, this is what Luke saw as most significant. First, the heavens were opened. Mark, in his account, his description is more vivid. The New English Bible translates that Jesus saw the heavens torn open. Now, we can't know what that looked like, but at that moment, uh, the creator of heaven and earth manipulated his creation to visibly send a message to not only the son he was to bless, but to all who were in attendance. And we know that because in John chapter 1, John the Baptist's testimony indicated that he at least saw the whole thing. The heavens themselves were parted, and he witnessed it. God had something to say. Uh, so significant was the moment that both Father and Spirit visibly announced its importance. In temporal terms, this was the Son's official call to service, underscoring what was surely his own consciousness of the work he was set apart to fulfill. And then the Holy Spirit uh, descended upon the Son. Luke says, in bodily form, like a dove. And what that means, uh, surely at least, is that the Spirit came down in a tangible uh, form. Uh, he took on the appearance of a, a, a dove. Why a dove? You know, the Old Testament gives us no indication of a dove or the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God being somehow associated with a dove. And uh, the, many of the commentators suggest that it was because of the gentle demeanor of a dove that he took on that appearance. And they are, their, their, their cooing is, is pleasant and gentle and we see them out the window battling for the bird feeder, but the, the, the doves tend to be, be gentle. In Isaiah 42, so think Isaiah, servant songs, four servant songs. Isaiah 42 is the first of the servant songs. Isaiah 42, verse 1, God speaks. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. Now at his baptism we see the spirit equipping the son for the arduous task ahead, anointing him in a sense, uh, which is what the Lord will soon acknowledge, and Luke records it. You just look across the page in verse uh, 16 of chapter 4, uh, entering the synagogue in Nazareth, taking the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and then appropriating the 61th chapter of Isaiah to proclaim the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. This has been fulfilled in your hearing, he said. Isaiah's prophecy was about him. And the Spirit was now upon him at this baptism, anointing him. And with the gentleness of a dove, he would fulfill his mission. As Kent Hughes observed in his commentary, Jesus was and is 
a lion. He is the lion of the tribe of, of Judah. His divine anger scorched the Pharisees, and he will return as a mighty warrior to judge the earth. And nevertheless, his ministry was characteristically gentle. He said, learn from me, uh, for I am gentle and humble in heart. So in these two short verses, uh, Luke has set before us uh, the son's baptism and then the spirit's anointing. It's only fitting then that what follows is the voice of the father expressing his approval and delight in his son. The voice came out of heaven. You are my beloved son and you I am well pleased. Twice in the Gospels, uh, God the Father audibly announced his pleasure uh, in his son. First here at the baptism, then later, you know, at his transfiguration. The pronouncement itself is something of a blend of two Messianic Old Testament passages, Psalm 2, verse 7, and uh, Isaiah 42, 1, which we referenced a moment ago. Psalm 2 verse 7 reads, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And remember that Psalm, it's, it's the voice of the son uh, projected into the future. And it follows the voice of God the Father who is pictured sitting in the heavens uh, laughing at the kings and rulers of the earth. Uh, they, they attempt to thwart his plan, the plan of him and his anointed one. And then you combine that, Psalm 2 verse 7 with Isaiah 42 verse 1, and the Savior described there by the Father as my chosen one in whom my soul delights. And you can see the source of the Lord's pronouncement. Think back, the angel had told Mary, Gabriel had told Mary uh, at the Annunciation that her miracle son would be the son of the Most High, uh, that the Holy Child would be called the Son of God. And it's not surprising then to hear God refer to Jesus as his son and that he is beloved. He's my beloved son. Uh, certainly means uh, that the Father loves uh, the Son, but when that word beloved is applied to one's own son or daughter, it always means only, only. Jesus is God's one and only Son. He has always been so. He has always been God's one and only Son. The systematic theologians call that the eternal generation of uh, the Son. He is eternally begotten of the Father. Separate in persons, but one in essence. And therefore, this is a perfect love that binds them. It's the highest expression of love that man can, can ever conceive. It is eternal and holy and intelligent and inexhaustible. It is outside time and space, and yet it was made manifest in time and space in the incarnation of the Son. The Father loved the obedience of the Son in emptying himself and taking on a human nature. He loved him in the temple as a young boy hearing the word of God and, and learning from the word of God. He loved, God loved the 30 years in which Jesus learned obedience and, and grew into adulthood. And he loved that the son knew where he was going and in great love for sinners was steadfastly taking up his future. How could the father not be well pleased with such a son. We'll see then how all three persons of our triune God uh, conspired, we might say, to effect our salvation. All three 
in love and work together to accomplish that. And we, we, we discover as we grow in our faith and we become more familiar with the script, scriptures, we discover these little telltale uh, statements in the Word of God that raise in our hearts uh, the wonder of it all. Uh, in verse 10 of Isaiah 53, the suffering servant a song, it pleased the Lord to crush him. How could it possibly have pleased the Father to crush his son? Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. He didn't spare his son. He, he, Jesus died. He died a, a terrible death, uh, bearing the wrath uh, of God for our sin. And God delivered him over to that. Then there's Jesus' high priestly prayer of John 17, praying fervently to his father to restore the glory he had with him before the world began, but also interceding for the ones he had come to say, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. And then the Spirit, this is Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself testifying with our spirit that we are the children of God. If we're able to grasp this fact and, and, and deeply absorb it into our thinking, that we are the objects of the deep, deep love of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that they are all three equally passionate about securing our salvation and bringing us to glory, then we will experience hope and, and comfort and the kind of purpose in living that make earthly pursuits pale in comparison. Jesus' baptism encapsulated that when the Spirit and the Father joined with the Son to venture forth in his saving mission. Well, now uh, Luke uh, couples this scene with the genealogy of Jesus. And that may seem at first impression uh, to be an abrupt change of course, but as I said at the beginning, uh, both serve a, a similar purpose to connect the Son of God with the humanity he came to save. He became a member of the human race, like you and me, a, a son of Adam, who, who Adam, as the first man, was a son of God. And so we read in verse 23, when he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of of Heli. Only Luke uh, gives us Jesus' age when he began his ministry. Thirty years was the age when uh, Levites uh, stepped into their official uh, service, according to Numbers 447. It was also typically the age with, at which a man was considered to be a mature uh, person. Well, Jesus was uh, supposed or reckoned to be the son of Joseph because, you know, Joseph and Mary raised Jesus as their son. And that's going to raise the issue of whose genealogy it is that follows, and we'll get to that quickly. Uh, but first, we should acknowledge several differences between Luke's genealogy and the one that we find in Matthew. First, they run in opposite directions. It's very interesting. Uh, Matthew's beginning with the ancestors and revealing how Jesus was born out of that ancestry. The re repeated phrase in Matthew is, so-and-so was the father of. Luke's 
begins with Jesus as the descendant of a line of ancestors and traces his lineage back in time instead of forward. And the repeated phrase is son of. Secondly, uh, Matthew's genealogy extends up to Abraham, Luke's back all the way to Adam and God. And that reflects, of course, each gospel writer's purpose and, and, and intended audience. Matthew was more narrowly focused on the Jewish audience, Luke with the wider world. The names uh, between David and Joseph are almost completely different in each, uh, though Matthew's first 14 names from Abraham to David agree with Luke's. Uh, Matthew skips more generations, uh, but you know, of course, that was an accepted practice. Son of, father of, could refer not just to immediate son or immediate father, but to grandfathers, great-grandfathers, grandsons. And then finally, uh, Matthew lists Jacob as Joseph's father. Luke lists Heli. And that highlights the issue. Why are the genealogies different? There have been a number of solutions proposed. I mean, a number of them. And I'm going to hold it to two uh, for you today. You can thank me later uh, for that. And I'll do this rather quickly, follow along closely. Uh, one solution is that uh, Matthew gives us the genealogy of Joseph, the legal father of Jesus. Not the actual father, but the legal father of Jesus. And Luke gives us that of Mary, the actual line of Jesus. And this understands Joseph as the son of Heli by marriage. Mary was the daughter of Heli. She had no brothers. So Heli, in accordance with ancient tradition, uh, having no sons, legally adopted Joseph when he married Mary. In Luke, in verse 23, look back again, advising us, reminding us that Jesus was not really the son of Joseph, but only the son of Mary by this supernatural conception, then proceeds to lay out the genealogy of Mary. This was by no means a, a typical practice, as you can imagine, to trace a genealogy through the female's line, but this was not a typical situation. And uh, besides, uh, God himself had designated Mary as the favored one. She is hail favored one, hail blessed one, hail you who have received the blessing of God. And that might have been enough to justify Luke's recording of Mary's genealogy. So that's one view. Another suggestion is that this is the result of a leveret marriage, L-E-V-I-R-A-T-E, -E, leveret marriage. We know about that from the Old Testament. You'll recall lever or lever is the Latin term for uh, a husband's brother. And so the custom was if a husband died childless, uh, the brother next in line was expected to step in and marry the widow in order to raise up children uh, to his name. And so in this scenario of a leveret marriage, Heli died uh, childless. Jacob was his brother through the same mother, but a different father. So Jacob married Heli's widow and Joseph was born. Uh, Matthew gives Joseph's genealogy through Jacob his actual father, Luke gives the genealogy through Heli, his legal father. <laughs> Where's Robert? I was telling you. Well, both of these explanations and, and, and others as well have weaknesses. The reality is we just cannot say for sure, but we do know there is an explanation that is true, and that was actually the case because the scriptures are true. 
and one day we will all be in on the mystery. Those are legitimate uh, explanations of what could explain the different genealogies. But we don't want to overlook the central point, and that is that Jesus Christ had a human lineage. It went all the way back to Adam, just as your lineage and mine do. He was a real man. Whatever interpretation you might study and, and opt for, his genealogy goes back to David, and therefore he is qualified to assume the promised dis designation of the son of David, the, the Messiah. And because he was a real man, uh, he was qualified to do Messiah's work, which was to assume the mantle of Adam's fallen state, reverse it by his perfectly righteous life and die a substitutionary and penal death on the cross in order that he might bring us with him into the family of God as his brothers and sisters in Christ through faith in God's grace. He became the last Adam in order that he might be the spotless Lamb of God who takes away our sin. The Apostle Paul wrote, mark this carefully in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as in, as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. And then a parallel uh, expression in Romans 5, verse 17, if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Only God's Son, who took on human nature and identified himself with the human race in the waters of baptism and who had a human lineage uh, going back to the very first man could reverse our pitiable condition and give us as a free gift eternal life and the promise of heaven when we die. Dr. Johnson used to quote one of the saints of old and I couldn't find uh, the exact quote, but it, it was something like this. Jesus Christ wed himself to the human race for eternity. What love, uh, what condescension, what sacrifice when we're able to disregard ourselves from worldly cares and contemplate these things truly contemplate these things, our hearts are, are filled with thanksgiving. The issue is we're distracted. We're distracted. Uh, it's a beautiful thing to ponder what God in Christ has done uh, for us, the security that we have. We're all going to die unless he comes again. Uh, we all got these ailments and we're all going to die. Uh, but we have the assurance that he came and he's gone before us. He's entered into the holy place uh, once and for all. And he's bringing with him in his wake, we might say, uh, pulling us in with him into the family of God uh, forever. Let's thank him. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the blessings that we see in this genealogy, uh, in uh, the baptism of your son, uh, joining with us, taking his place uh, shoulder to shoulder uh, with us, saying, I want to identify uh, with these sinners because I'm going to save them. Such is the love that Father, Son, and Spirit have for each one of us. May we live lives, as we're so often reminded by Dan, uh, 
lives of gratitude for what you have done for us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.